two thumbs up. Yeah. I agree totally on that. Oh, oh we lost them again. So I'm the general manager of Geeks and Games. We are a tabletop store that's based here in Qatar. We do a lot of events with cafes and some institutions like schools and summer camps and clubs. And we do primarily trading card games, board okay. games, and uh, Lego robotics. For everybody that's watching, uh, my name is Rick. I'm the host and creator of a uh, program called Rick Rolls America, where I was traveling around the United States, going to friendly local game stores, doing live stream content to spotlight the store, the community they're building, and how they engage with the community beyond the store. Um, I have uh, previously I worked for Alliance Game Distributors as their media production manager for Game Trade Media, making all sorts of fun content that some of you may have seen uh, out in the universe on the on the interwebs or not. If not, no surprise. <laughs> but we are here to talk about in the, at least the first forty five minutes of this program to talk about tabletop gaming. If you guys have any questions in the chat, please ask them. I see that there are some questions that have been asked below. What's the best website for board game news and releases? Jason, what, what would your answer to that be? I would say it would definitely be board, board game space or boardgamegeek.com. Yeah, I actually put board game geek in the, as my uh, answer to that. Then there's some miniature questions, and we'll get to those ones uh, during the miniature painting session. Jason, what would you say is a great introductory game to get new players to the table? There's a lot of interesting gateway games, which are like the beginner games you can start with when you're getting into tabletop. So something like Carcassonne, which is easy, like a tile placement game, or a game where there's a lot of um, variants like Settlers of Catan. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that these would be an easy game to start off with. One of the things I usually recommend, I, I actually wrote uh, Catan or um, Ticket to Ride as a response to that question, because uh, they're very much gateway games that get uh, get people into the into the um, tabletop space. But another thing is, you know, if you know your friends, you know what they probably like. So a lot of people uh, find like party games uh, to be something really um, easy. Uh, I actually have an example here of one called Medium by Greater Yeah, that's Indian. really cool. And this is a fun one where everybody's trying to think about what the other person's word is based on two words that have been played. It's super fun, um, but anything that is, is uh, like like this one here by uh, Fireside Games, this is a game of charades, but all you're using is they'll give you some words and you use a string to create that thing. It's, That's really cool. Yeah, it's super fun. unique concept. Yeah. yeah. So... I had a question for you, Jason, and again, anybody in the chat, if you have other questions, please ask. What is the climate like in regards to the type of games that are most sought after in Qatar? Most people are used to playing abstract games. So okay. if we discuss the abstract game category, they would start off with something like checkers, or drafts, or chess. So this is what people think of when they I think of a board game. I'm speaking locally, like with the Qatari community or with like uh, people from the subcontinent like India or Pakistan. So this is what the, their perception is. And then a lot of people think of like Monopoly or Life or Risk as like a starter board game or something that they started out with. So we tend to start people off with gateway games. Okay. Um, there's a, some games where there's some ways where they will have to decipher some information or like a team play game like One Night Werewolf, right. or uh, Code Names is also a really good one. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have Code Names translated into Arabic now, so right. there's a localized uh, version. So there, it depends on the demographic. As uh, Qatar is made up of a, a wide community of expats and Qataris as well, there's different mm -hmm. tastes when it comes to games. Okay. Yeah. So people have a some people like simple games where there's not a lot of reading or writing, and then there's some other people who like games where that are very skill intensive, where you have to think um, a few turns ahead or you have to have some planning involved. You said that uh, in Qatar, abstract games seem to be a really popular version. Have you seen this one? Uh, Shobu. Shobu. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is such a great abstract game. It's super popular here in the States. 
And, and I, I think that's really funny that you mentioned abstracts as a popular game in Qatar and also uh, where they think about monopoly and life. I mean, it's this, it's the same mindset here in the States. If someone isn't already a adapter to tabletop gaming or has it in their life, when you bring it up to them, it's like, like monopoly. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> it should be something that's thriving here because we have this thing here uh, in the GCC. All right. In, in Kuwait, it's called Diwania. Here in Qatar, it's called Majlis. All right. So basically, pre corona, every Friday night or Thursday night, uh, a group of guys will get together in like a little kind of like a clubhouse, I guess you'd call it. It's like a, a building that's either added onto the outside of the building or it's its own little thing. And then they all go and then they play games, uh, drink coffee, you know, gawa, whatever. And then they just talk and they chill for like most of the night. You know, people have game tournaments and everything. Uh, I went to one with Hamid, Al- uh, Hamid Alamari, the Qatari comedian here, and they were playing this card game, which was like a Western called like Shoot, Shoot, Bang or something. Oh, it's Bang the dice game? Jason, you know what it is. Bang, yeah. Yeah, yeah they were playing that, and they were crazy into it. Um, now, in Kuwait, there's a huge D&D and Warhammer, Pathfinder, all that stuff scene. Uh, but here, it doesn't seem quite as big. I don't know. What do you think, Jason? It depends on a lot of factors. The thing is, like what we were speaking about earlier, the simpler games are more popular. So, like, the abstract style... And then I would say after that would be like the area control type of games, which Bang could kind of fall into. You have a turn and you have an action and it's kind of competitive, whereas you can interact with another player or eliminate them. So these are the style of the games that are liked. If you look at the historical games that are played in the Majelises here in Qatar, like um, Brasilia, like the card games and stuff like that, it's easy to transition with the card game first before getting into like a full-size box board game. So like Bang is perfect. It's a very good example of a, of a entry-level game that's popular here. Exploding Kittens is another one that's really, really popular. If you were to recommend like one of the more advanced ones like Warhammer, because I know there's two types of Warhammer. There's 40K and then the, uh, the, the more fancy of Sigmar. one. Yeah. Right. Age of Sigmar, um, Sigmar, yeah. Especially now that they have like three new starter sets and stuff like that, what do you think would be like the best one? Because I know there's D and D, there's Pathfinder, there's Warhammer, and then there's um, what's the one I used to like until the show ruined it? Game of Thrones. <laughs> Warhammer as a game is kind of interesting because there's two entry points at the moment. The one entry point is your standard 40k game, where you assemble an army according to uh, points cap and you play against each other. But there's a new version of Warhammer 40k that is really, really interesting at the moment. It's called Kill Teams. It works on a smaller um, version of teams like squads, which is easier to pick up, um, less complicated when it comes to assembly and painting. So this has gathered quite a good following at the moment. And of course, price point. Um, A really good uh, 40k army could be like uh, in dollars, $1,500, $2,000, $1,500, $2,000, which is about 5000 to 7000 reals. So it's quite an investment to put into a game if you don't know if you're really going to like it or not. Uh, to play Warhammer or to like that universe, you kind of have to like the lore. Um, it is a big selling point in that game. Yeah, as far as Warhammer goes, uh, I've painted hundreds of miniatures for Warhammer. I have never played the game. <laughs> but I would say as an entry game... Uh, I like Dungeons and Dragons because all you need to do is get the DM guide, the player's handbook, and the monster manual, and that's really all you need. Everything else is just fluff to the game, but you can create your own worlds and verses and everything just using those three books, and that's a minimal investment for a long time of play. d d is a very popular game here in Qatar. I think over the last three to four years, there's really been an increase in the number of groups and players that are playing the game, meeting up to do campaigns, uh, meeting up to do the regular Adventure adventure League, which is sanctioned by the WPN, Wizards of the Coast. So you get special 
magical item. So somehow for the DM, it takes out some of the head work because you get like a unique item for going to your store or popping into an event or playing through a campaign, which makes it interesting and relative to the story. Can you take like, uh, say, regional or local culture and apply that, like gins and stuff like that? So in Dungeons and Dragons, gins already exist, and they also have uh, genasi as player characters. So you could play like a water or a fire genasi or an air genasi. Uh, but uh, yeah, you can absolutely play gins. I wish I actually painted one about a week ago uh, from WizKids. They made a, a, a beautiful gin in the, their Wave 12, or 11 or 12 line of miniatures. And it, yeah, so you can take obviously the cultural um, mythologies and and legends of. of uh, different regions and, and apply them to the game, absolutely. Yeah, WizKids have really upped their game on the miniatures in the last two years. Um, I'm a Heraclix player. I have a golden and modern army from way back. It's not that popular in Qatar, but if you compare the miniatures from like 2013 and 2019, it's like ch chalk and cheese. It's, yeah, yeah the, you can see an example. The, the Griffin, that's like amazing. Yeah. If you looked at a griffin like three years ago, you would think it would maybe maybe it was an eagle or something. <laughs> yeah, super tiny, one two dimensional, even though it's supposed to be yeah. three dimensional. Uh, and this is so for everybody watching. This one is uh, coming out next month, so this is a, so a sneak peek for everybody out here at, at the expo. Uh, just to show you again, just how beautiful it is, and we'll talk about more of that later. You got like a whole box of those, didn't you? I did. Yeah, WizKid sent, sent me a lot of products to demo, paint, and uh, promote. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> now, I'm seeing I'm seeing a lot more uh, content on YouTube and Twitch and stuff with uh, Tabletop. Why do you think that is? I'll let you go first, Rick. Okay. I think there's two different ways to approach this question. Yeah, there, there really is. I think with COVID, um, one of the things that we saw when, when COVID hit is Every bought, everybody bought webcams. <laughs> uh, like literally, they were out for like two months. You couldn't, you couldn't find one at Best Buy. You couldn't order one off Amazon. Um, and the community, uh, because of COVID, everybody's stuck in their house. More people playing games. More people wanting to show off their games. And just because of the ease of access to social media, not just YouTube, but like oddly, I've got TikTok running live right now as well. And uh, on on TikTok, I'm known as Tabletop Santa. And there are some game, there are some gamer uh, game creators on there that make content around gaming. They have a hundred thousand followers, and it's like what? And they all are you know they're joining together on Discord. I think Discord is a huge factor to that as well because they're building great communities, and uh, they can get together through those communities. And be like, hey, I'm going to do a Zoom live stream, boom, and it's done. And it's just it's insane how awesome it's becoming and how mainstream and. I think COVID has been a great asset to that point of life, but everything else, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You, what about you, Jason? Yeah, to add on to what uh, Rick was saying, um, painting is a very uh, a, a hobby where you need a lot of time, time intensive. So having a lot of the spare time or perhaps being at home or having shortened working hours has allowed people to dust off their shelves perhaps like have a go at a, a board game model to test out their painting skills or finally get stuck into a model that's been on the shelf for a while that they'd like to try and paint. And then a lot of the products that have come out, I'd say from the end of 2019, uh, no, 2018 until, until now, are very beginner orientated. So you can see like a lot of starter learn how to paint models, learn how to cut, learn how to glue, where it was like uh, you got a really complex model before and it was very skill based where you would have to have some skill to do assembly or paint or filing. So I think that they've really looked at a gap in the market and made something for, for new aspiring uh, tabletop uh, gamers or model builders. The other day I was on YouTube because obviously it's like based on how I make my living and everything. And there's uh, a YouTube channel called Cosmonaut Variety Hour. And they did uh, like a 30 minute video on Warhammer. And then like the first 20 minutes is him discussing, you know, the different things. And so, so it was really good. I liked it. I watched it twice just so I can 
and you see a lot of the minutiae and stuff. And then he actually linked to a lot of other creators, which was cool because a lot of YouTubers don't do that. But at the end, he actually did a thing where he sat down to, I guess, alleviate concerns of other people about the painting because, you know, that's the one of the biggest parts of not just Warhammer, but he did one of the um, the main, the Space Marines or whatever. He did one in like 20 minutes. So it showed me, it's like, wow, it's not that complicated. And he's not like an artist guy. So it got me in, between that and then the, um, the the YouTube channel where the guy did the all by himself, those really great cinematics of Warhammer. What is it called? Like a Treyas or something like that. It's got me really interested in like, I want to do it now. I think, Jason, you're like the only place, right? We have a range of um, tabletop games. There is a Warhammer community that's already based in Qatar. They meet up at uh, uh, players' houses uh, and that, and we tried to engage with them before. We hosted some tournaments and that. The issue with Warhammer is when you have a small community, um, people have very select needs. So, like you've mentioned, like let's say Rick wants to play sp Space Marines, but I want to play like. Um, Eld like Eldar, a space Eldar, something. So, uh, when people build their armies, you're looking for specific models. When you scale up and you want like a tank or a bigger unit, you, the thing is with Warhammer, they have a really good sales pitch where they have like internet exclusives and that which are not always available to local stores. So, you're always competing with uh, online in that aspect. And uh, Warhammer from the UK would pretty much ship anywhere. Um, if you were in Afghanistan, they would ship you a model. They wouldn't be an issue like to get that. So um, that's killed a lot of the availability problems that they had before. And if you look at Games Workshop module, especially in the UK, they own a lot of the stores. Um, there's a different model to working like in the UK, U US or, or South Africa, for example, where they've been in the market for like, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Rick, like 30 years now. They started in the mid 80s. So they have that financial clout or ability to provide these um, gaming rooms or war gaming rooms or games workshop uh, areas. And then also provide um, limited edition content and stuff like that as well. So it's a game where you need a big community to thrive um, for the competitiveness of it and to be able to have a lot of variance and play against different armies and uh, have access to different models and stuff. Is there a Wheel of Time one? Uh, there are Wheel of Time board games, um, but I'm not familiar with a, like a miniature-based one, but I know that there are Wheel of Time board games. Is that a, very po is that a popular series there? No, um, I don't know, maybe, but it's going to be soon because Amazon's doing the show and everything. Two tabletop games that have come out recently is uh, Song of Fire and Ice from Game of Thrones. I know that uh, Rick is uh, planning to paint that. And then there's um, a new Marvel game that came out in a kind of weird time last year. So that's really taking the tabletop community by storm. The models are not very difficult to paint, and it's kind of like a paint by numbers thing, where if you look at Warhammer or some of the other games, you have to be like a little bit creative. I mean, they do have a guideline for like color schemes and that, but you can pretty much do your, your own thing. Like, let's say you're playing in a Marvel game, you wouldn't see a pink Spider-Man. Like, you, there would be a color scheme. So, so that's easier for new players, if I could put it like that. Yeah, that game is called Crisis Protocol, and it's by, um, I can't remember, but Crisis Protocol is it's Marvel's Crisis Protocol. It's really good. I'd rate it 9 out of 10. Yeah. The miniatures are ridiculously good. Like I was like, They're so oh, good. Yeah. I haven't even seen it. It must be very new. <laughs> yeah, the okay. problem is, yeah. it's so popular, it's hard to get your hands on stuff. I don't know what it is, like, stateside, Rick. But with us being under European distribution uh, mm -hmm. for the GCC, it's it's kind of difficult. Yeah. So, can I ask that question? Then? Again, that's a that's a question I've been asking a lot of the publishers here before coming onto this program because I wanted to make sure that they had a, their product availability to Qatar. Does that is it Asma Day that's distributing from Europe to y'all, or is it somewhere? Uh, is it another big distribution? And if 
it, uh, whether that is maybe some of the publishers I work with, and get, in, get in touch with them to make sure that they can get product to you guys. Okay, so our general distribution for the GCC um, falls under a company called Board Game Space Middle East. They're currently based out of Dubai. But for the last two and a half years, we faced a lot of um, problems due to the geopolitical situation that we have here with the blockade. So mm -hmm. this has um, really narrowed the amount of products we can bring in and the types of products we can bring in. Okay. So w previous to this, we do have a, an agreement with them. We do represent Qatar for selling and distributing games and uh, board game space, but it's been hard to act on that. So I would say they have about 15 active licenses. Um, Asmodee, um, they are under board game space. So all Asmodee games are sold, sold by them uh, for the whole Middle East region. So that includes like Lebanon, um, uh, Syria as, as well, and then the GCC. So this is this is their scope, but like it is difficult to convince them to send the games out here, and more so when it comes to support like special store edition championship uh, product like uh, championship kits. I think you'll know about them, Rick, or like something like a limited edition or store exclusive. These are harder to get. I think the the best company overall that gives us support in the GCC is Wizards of the Coast, uh, which is Magic the Gathering and D and D, pretty much is their two flagship games. Do they make Pathfinder too? They do not. No, that's Paizo. Paizo Publishing. In Kuwait. I actually met a guy named Jason who wrote a lot of the Pathfinder stuff, like the steampunk things. But yeah, he was deep into it, man. I didn't realize how big that... I had never heard of it, and then he was like, oh yeah, I wrote this book, and this book, and this book, and... Yeah, to give um, you some context about tabletop games, and the influence that players have on our region, the X-Wing Miniatures playtesters, mm -hmm. two of the top playtesters are based in Kuwait, for, for Fantasy Flight. Wow. Yeah, so, they play that many games, and they have that kind of community. Um, good, uh, a good game in Kuwait is the board game store. And they actively play over there. They also have board games, dojo, and yeah, Tam's hobbies. So yeah. in a country which is also like a city state, similar to Qatar, they have three hobby gaming stores. Wow. So it's, and then they have a specialized store for Yu-Gi-Oh as well, which is just, it's called Dueling Masters, which has got no board games and no hobby gaming. So they're pretty, they have four stores. Yeah, because when you look at Kuwait compared to a lot of the other places in the region, there is less to do um so the a lot of the arts and a lot of the hobby stuff is a lot bigger there even though it's a smaller country just like social media kuwait is one of the biggest users in the world they were one of the first countries to get instagram and everything um and it's why their influencer scene is so huge as well uh i saw that we had some questions in the uh, ask questions area yeah and i thought i saw one that was super funny if you don't mind i would like to uh, answer the question. It says, "Can you tell if someone is a tabletop gamer when you first meet them?" <laughs> the yeah, answer is yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, I thought that was such a funny question. It was, uh, but the answer is yes. I personally assume everyone is a tabletop gamer when I first meet them because I hope that they are, right? Because if they're at a convention or at a store, you hope that's the case. But a stereotypical gamer. Oddly, looks like me. Tall, heavy set, bearded, always carries a backpack with all their games in it. <laughs> so, yeah, we all look alike. <laughs> I think you can also judge it by the interest level. If you say some special keywords like, do you know what Fantasy Flight is? Or do you know what Asmode yeah. is? Or one of the other popular, like Rio Grande or Days of Wonder. Yeah. So these are like kind of like geek slang or lingo that you'd hear people talking about, like or saying, hey, "Have you guys heard about Bizer Games that, or the new game yeah. that's coming out?" So it looks like uh, Amriki got a little bit of uh, frozen camera going on, okay. but I, I like that pose. He's like, "Yeah, yeah." Games. I think there's there's another question here that we can answer. Are there any good tabletop games? that can be played while social distancing. Our community here, through the power of Discord, that uh, Rick spoke about earlier, 
is playing a lot of code names and then uh, steam also has a lot of board games that you can play with on your steam account like um memoir 44 i'm sure you know about that one uh, Rick, yeah, from, from days of wonder that's actually for free on steam so if you want to play a game and you have a steam account and you have discord that's a really good place to meet other board gamers yeah yeah so uh, that's for jetzilla yeah, and, and to carry on on that, uh, that question and answer, um, there's a there's a new platform called Tabletop Simulator, and so many so many publishers are putting their games on there that you can just you log in, you go through the catalog, you find oh I want to try this by this publisher, um, and because of Gen Con Online uh, this past weekend, there was a huge uh, use of the Tabletop Simulator uh, platform. So yeah, and you can play when you get on the paper similar again, you can play with anybody in the world. Which yep, is amazing. That's true. And all the games that almost almost every game that was premiered at Gen Con last weekend is on Tabletop Simulator now. So that's it's amazing to think that that is a great way to connect not just gamers, but the world of gaming to everybody uh, on a on a platform like that. So amazing. It, would you recommend that people get that? Because I'm not sure if it's free or if it costs. You can get it on Steam. Because uh, mm -hmm. I know you can try out the games. Like, you can try out Warhammer or Song of Fire and Ice on there. It's Is about 50 reels in the Steam store yeah. for Tabletop Simulator. Uh, about 15.99 US, I'd guesstimate somewhere around there. Yeah, something like that. It's like 15 or 20 bucks US. and uh, It's well I worth think, it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you... if Every game on there is free access. There might be some pay to pay to uh, yeah. play, and if, if so, again, I think it's worth it. Because if I wanted to play Shobu with somebody across across the waters, how awesome is that? And if it cost me nineteen dollars to have it on in my library of virtual games, I would absolutely pay pay something like that. Could you use that if you're a DM to maybe try out like a scenario that you were thinking of? Absolutely, but also sure. for. For D and D uh, and other tabletop role playing games, there is uh, Roll Twenty dot net, and um, which is kind of like what we're doing right now, except uh, there's a map system. So if you want to play, if you want to build your own maps and uh, show where your characters are and everything, you can do all that on that platform in conjunction with D and D Beyond. They they communicate very well together. So there's there's so many. Again, I think I also lead back to your earlier question: is how why are we seeing such an increase in content creators and YouTubers and everything doing this is because there's so many tools that make it so easy, at like, like Tabletop Simulator, Simulator like Roll20, like D&D Beyond. I've been watching your stuff, like, because you're everywhere. Like, there, you, <laughs> you're like me. You put out so much content, it's hard to keep up with. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was funny. A lot of the content I create, people don't even see. You're putting a lot of TikTok stuff up, and then you've got, I think you're streaming too, and then you have the videos. Mm -hmm. uh, did, have you talked about yet, like your whole like I'm just gonna do like Kane and Kung Fu, but for tabletop or what? So I I haven't I I, I don't I didn't really uh, I kind of in the beginning kind of talked about you know I, I traveled to the United States and doing all that stuff, but um, no I haven't really talked about you know what I what my vision is for how I want to promote because I'm all about promoting gaming because it was such a big part of my life coming up. You know, a uh, little story time for your audience. <clears throat> so I was um, I was in foster care coming up in high school, and uh, during that time, you know, it's, it's, be, being put in the foster care system is kind of a dark space. And I found gaming, and, and I found a gaming community, uh, and they brought me in under their wings, and they're like they're dragon wings, and I'm, they're playing D and D and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and justifies rpg and magic gathering when it comes out and then when i and it literally like kept me kept me safe in a safe zone then i joined the military and then for 20 years i'm in the military and no place i went did i not find another gamer or a game store or someone to share in the hobby with and it, again when you're overseas like when i was in kuwait i played D, &D all the time <laughs> so it's like uh it's always been a part of my life and i want to make sure that i can share that with the community of uh, out there, people that are already engaged in gaming, and people that are on the fringe that see it and are like curious. Hey, what is that thing? Why, why are they so happy around that table? <laughs> right? Come on in, come to my table, play the games. That's what I'm all about. 
Um, and that's that's my main message is everybody is welcome and everybody should play. I think that tabletop gaming brings a lot of people together that usually wouldn't be in uh, the same circles. Like yeah. it's a good uh, way to meet new friends. If you're a little bit uh, introverted, it's a good way to meet new people. Um, also, like if you've come out to Qatar and maybe you're struggling to find friends, it's a good medium to find some people that have similar likes. Like you may be into Star Wars or fantasy or something like that. So I think a lot of people have built a lot of long-lasting friendships around the board game table or through a D&D campaign. Oh, absolutely. One thing I want to talk about too, it's a little personal kind of thing, is I was foster care, and then I joined the military to be a firefighter medic. And then all along though, from when I was a kid until growing up, it was all into gaming and geek stuff. When you used to get made fun of for it, you know what I mean? And then once I got out and became a filmmaker and everything, I started talking about movies and games and stuff more to people. So what was it that made you, I mean, I know you're trying to like spread the message and everything. It's same thing with you, Jason, like this isn't normal. You know what I'm saying? Like there's geeks and then there's us, right? So what made you become that? I think it's hard. it was harder in our generation. I always tell like the new kids that are playing games now, it's very easy to be a geek nowadays because there's a lot of things like the mainstream marvel dc i mean i remember when i started playing magic around 1999 when i was in school the people just like pick on us try and grab our cards and destroy them you know we had like some crazy cards from like urza saga and stuff back then so yeah it was different it was a different time yeah if you like comics uh, Spider-Man and stuff wasn't main, that mainstream. I think uh, it started to pick up around 2002 when Marvel had like the the start of their first MCU universe with the first uh, the first trilogy of Spider-Man movies and stuff. And I mean, there were people that Blade. liked Star Wars and people that loved Star Wars. If you had like some collectibles or something, you'd definitely be like a a black sheep. It wasn't something that was like common i mean i grew up in a different place to you guys like i grew up in africa so i think it was like a double stereotype because it was like you like something which is like not a cultural norm and something that was like very weird from the status quo of what a normal kid is supposed to like that's from my side I, I, speaking about where i come from so as far as uh, uh for me i think what it is is because again, the community that I grew up with was super accepting and, and kept me engaged in that community for 30, 30 plus years. But the thing that really made me change my, my focus and why I wanted to do what I do now and kind of like how you do uh, is I had kids. And when my kids started showing interest in the things that I showed interest in, it made me want to make sure that they didn't have to deal with any, the bullies and the uh, individuals that didn't understand it and then spoke poorly of it uh, so that they don't have to witness that. So if I, if I can spread the message out so that my kids have a better experience in gaming, uh, I think that's one of the big reasons I do it too because my, all of my kids are fans of tabletop in some capacity. Obviously, my, my two boys are just, I mean, if it's Xbox and computer, uh, you know, streaming on Twitch or what have you, and they, that's what they want to do for their life. That's their, my, my youngest is like, I can make money playing video games. Yes, buy me a chair, Dad. Give me a good system. I'm, I'll spend every hour of every day. You know, so I think that's one of the big reasons is why I wanted to spread the messages for my kids. How do you balance gaming and hobbies and all that stuff with, uh, even if you don't have kids, like your job and everything else? How can you find that healthy balance? It's tough, especially again when I have kids that play games and want to play games. Um, so I, I'm not married. My kids, you know, some of my kids are grown or 28 and 25 years old, um, have their own lives and do their own things. Right. And then I have my 14 and 16 year old and, uh, I, I try to balance it to what best benefits them like when they have time for me, I give them my time, but because my life, and like you said, I make a lot of content. It's like, I don't almost, I almost never stop. I have a notebook by me all the time. And I'm writing down like, okay, that, that sounds like a good thing, or I should reach out for that. Um, so it's just my life. I don't really have a good balance. I, I actually don't have a good balance. It's gaming all the time. I'm constantly on. <laughs> that's a, 
a difficult one as well. I mean, if you play board games, it's not that time intensive. If you would compare it with like uh, playing a miniatures game like Warhammer or Song of Fire and Ice or uh, Marvel Origins, you need a lot of time to set a lot of time to learn the rules, how to play and paint and stuff. And then if you get into the trading card games, that's like a time sink. I mean, like a game like Magic the Gathering um, will take up a lot of time in your life. You'll be searching for decks online. You'd be playing on something like um, Magic the Gathering Arena, which is a free-to-play game. Um, you can either grind or use your credit card, as they do nowadays. So um, I find that a lot of people that are trying to stay competitive, especially focusing on um, Magic the Gathering, you will need about 8 to 10 hours uh, a week to, to stay good, as they say. So... If, I mean, as a minimum, like, it's the same with video gaming. Um, if you get your head out the game, you lose it. So, so yeah, it's it's a different uh, type of game because of the competitive nature. Yeah, I, but I think one of the things that helps uh, maintain that balance, too, is if, you're, if your friends and family are as interested in the content and, and, the, and the gaming that you are, it's, you know, your balance comes to let's play this game together and then you get to spend your quality time with your family uh, and friends around the table still playing games but you know it's just a change of energy from content creation to you know socializing the guy was asking he says i was huge into playing DD in second edition but i haven't played really much in the past 20 years because i keep moving countries in every couple of years how's the game evolved and what is different in DD and fifth edition? So I played in second edition and uh, fifth edition. Uh, Rick, what would you you say about the comparisons? Um, it's like a whole different game. Yeah, I, yeah. It is, well, role playing is role playing. I don't you know the, I don't care what game it is. It, it, role playing is role playing. The mechanics and the ease of entry from second edition to fifth edition are night and day. Second edition, um, when Zeb Cook and Gary Gygax and all those guys made second edition, uh, it was it was a great game for its time. But again, I think the popularity doesn't just come from the fact that you've got like your Matt Mercers and your Joe Manganiello's and uh, Satine Phoenixes and all these celebrities that are big promoters of the hobby, uh, which helps. But the ease of entry because the rule system is so much easier. Uh, the, the books read so much better. Their web, their, their, their layouts are so good. Um, well written. Yeah. yeah, they're so well written, uh, and that I think brings that ease of entry in, and that's what's made it so popular. And that's why fifth, fifth edition, in my opinion, again, just my opinion. I, I know some people come at me, but fifth edition for D and D has been the best thing ever for that game. <clears throat> Two thumbs up. Yeah, I agree totally on that. Uh, oh, we lost them again. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, let's take a look at a couple of the questions. There, there's some really good ones in here. Uh, what are the most popular games in Qatar? Magic, D and D, Warhammer. What else? Um, and then someone asked for, a question for you, Jason, too. How how can one find a regular group to play long campaigns with? There's, so there's a few tabletop gaming groups here in Qatar. We do have our own events, but we very much also promote that you meet up with friends and you join other groups. Uh, if you look at campaign style games, uh, there's a few of them that are playing um, Imperial Assault. I think you know Trick the Star Wars game. And Gloomhaven. That's another really good game. If you like into miniatures and you want to do like a role playing style of game. And then, yeah, if you have a game that you want to play, uh, it's a very social thing. Ask people. Like, say, I've got like Catan who wants to play. Or I've, I've got Gloomhaven who wants to get into a campaign. Um, I think people here are very open, but I do find that um, sometimes committing to like a regular schedule is difficult. Um, with the COVID restrictions being lifted for us now, uh, since last week, we'll we'll have a roster or a schedule up on Facebook or Instagram for the meetups, and um, yeah, we'll we'll go from there. I know that the Tuesday group that's meeting up in quick bites in the Marriott um, is like on a booking basis only because of the, the restrictions about the number of people 
who can sit at a table and that social distancing interaction. So I think to answer that wholly, um, it is coming up, but it may take like two to three weeks um, to get back into the regular um, uh, schedule that we have and to make sure that we can do it safely. This is the main concern. Alright, so th there's one last, uh, there's one layer that says, speaking of celebs, tabletop gaming, uh, what do you guys think of Will Wheaton's show tabletop? I thought while it aired it was great, it was a great uh, way for people to be more uh, invested in the gaming space. Uh, it's sad that it doesn't exist anymore. I think Will Wheaton is a great champion for tabletop. And uh, he just got signed on to be the spokesperson for Bicycle Cards, which is now making yes. board games, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, if you want to suggest something else, uh, you can check out Dice Tower's content. Yeah. They do a lot of videos. If you're looking for something that's uh, related to new games, yeah. We want to segue into uh, the painting portion. So we answered everybody's questions and everything. And now I'm definitely curious to see this. I want to watch it and see what's going on with it. Why have you chosen to do uh, a Song of Fire and Ice for the for the painting? So uh, I did a little research and I found out that uh, the move, the TV series Game of Thrones was super popular in Qatar. And uh, uh, I guess when you guys have had different like convention and events, a lot of those celebrities have come to those events. So uh, based on that information is why I chose it. Um, and plus the miniatures are just so freaking good. I will be painting the mountain today. Before we skip out to that, I, can I, I just like to say something to everybody that's uh, watching. Play more board games, everyone. They are an amazing way to not just uh, increase like your um, tactical and critical thinking skills, but it's a great way to socialize with your friends and family. And I will guarantee you, there is a game for everybody. Regardless of your interest, there is something that has been made in the tabletop space that you will find that scratches that itch for you, be it true crime stuff to uh, the jokey stuff to party games, trivia. It, it's all there. The best place to find it is at your friendly local game store, like Jason's uh, location and the other stores that were mentioned earlier uh, in Kuwait and so on. So please go out, play more games. It is, it's the best. Especially right now with COVID happening and everything else, even if it's just you and your, your family or you and your wife or brothers, whatever, man, you can definitely yeah. get into it, you know, and even if you're not sure which ones you'll like, there's books, there's games that can introduce you into that, that world and the lore mm -hmm. and everything else. And GAG actually delivers here in Qatar, so you don't have to worry about the virus and stuff. <laughs> yeah, we had a very busy day with so, the new Fast and Furious game. So, okay. yeah, that kept me on my toes today. <laughs> Hope it's going to be good. And I think what's important is when a place is run by somebody who actually does it and cares about it, it's a big difference. You know what I mean? Like, when I watch your show, Rick, I know it's because you love what you're doing and everything else. And Jason, I know that he loves his stuff. He has to for everything he goes through over here. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I guess we'll go ahead and switch over to you painting the mountain, which should be pretty awesome. Awesome. Thank you for joining us uh, again here for the Qatar Game Expo. I am Rick of Rick Rolls America. If you are on TikTok, you can find me at Tabletop Santa, all one word. Um, but to get into the whole process of uh, painting miniatures, the first thing we want to talk about is what do you need, right? That's Everybody asked that question. <clears throat> it was actually in the questions on, on the uh, uh, platform here. And what you're going to need is, <clears throat> first, paints. I uh, so I have and I will be using a lot of Vallejo paints today. Uh, uh, they're a company out of Spain. Uh, they're amazing paint line, but there are so many other paint companies out there, such as um, this, these right here are MSP Bones. So this is by uh, Reaper Miniatures. They make their own paints, and uh, they have some really good paints as well. And then there's also Army Painter War Paints, uh, which make I like their, their their flesh tones and their shades, so I'll probably use a little bit of these today too. And then of course, if you're a fan of Warhammer or anything Games Workshop, they prefer that you use their product, which is the Citadel paint line right there. And they come in these little like um, pots of paint. And I will say this, um, there are so many paint companies out there besides these ones that I'm talking about that you could literally fill your toolbox up with just a ton of different 
things, but find the ones that you like. You may like this from Citadel, that from there, and that's how you build build your palette, right? It's based on what you like. Um, I but I will be using a lot of Vallejo today. The next thing you're going to want, obviously, and that people ask about, are brushes. Yeah, you, you need a toolbox to put it all in. Uh, so the next thing you have are brushes. Uh, you can, there are multiple different versions of brushes, uh, different companies, again, Army Painter, Vallejo, Reaper, they all make their own brush brands. Um, I have a lot of Army Painter brushes in here. There's also like, um, I think this is a Citadel right here. Uh, but there's, so brushes is the next thing. And making sure that you do a lot of brush care uh, afterwards is important so that the, the brushes will have a long life. Um, uh, and won't lose their tips. So you can see that I recap them so that they don't get bent based on the way they're put in. <clears throat> so you need brushes. And you, <clears throat> when you're first starting, excuse me, when you're first starting painting, you don't have to go out and buy the expensive brushes. You can go, if you have a hobby store that sells them on, the, on uh, some inexpensive ones, so you can practice, awesome. I always recommend here in the States, if, if, if going and getting a pack of brushes for $24, uh, is outside of your your price range. Go to Michaels, get a uh, little starter bag. Go to Walmart; they have little starter bags of brushes. They're not great, <clears throat> and they're not going to give you the quality of paint on miniature that you can get with these. <clears throat> Excuse me, <clears throat> but they will work to get you started. Sorry about that. All right. So after you got your paint, you got your brushes. You're going to need a little bit of water to to clean your brushes off. You're going to need some paper towel to wipe your brushes off. I'm going to stand up for this for a second. I apologize. And then there's some other tools to the trade because not all miniatures come pre pre-made. <clears throat> so like a lot of miniatures from games workshop, they come on what's called a sprue and you have to, and this is where miniatures is also modeling as a hobby. So you're going to need some, some clippers, to clip the miniatures off your their sprues, and then you're gonna use glue to glue them together, right? Sometimes you're gonna need you're gonna need like an exacto knife, right? And the reason you're gonna use that is because when you get a miniature, and I'll show some of them here. When you get a miniature, you're gonna want to inspect it. Sometimes you're and you're gonna want to clean them. So wash them with some soap and water because they're gonna have a releasing agent on them. That releasing agent. Uh, when you spray your primer and, and stuff on the miniature can sometimes um, make it so it doesn't stick quite proper. Uh, so when you're inspecting your miniatures, you're looking for what are called mold lines. And when you find a mold line, you're going to take that exact knife and you're just going to clean it off. Uh, Games Workshop also makes a really nice bladed uh, tool that uh, it's not an exact knife. It's, 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 just a, it's a line cleaner and it's super nice, um, but that's what you're going to do. Uh, for your miniatures, you're going to clean them up, take them off, uh, carve down any mold lines, and another great tool because when you're putting miniatures together, if that unlike the Simon ones, um, sometimes the miniatures don't go quite right together. There's always a potential for error, maybe some warping due to heat, uh, so the miniature won't quite seal. There might be some gapping right in the miniature, and then you're going to want to use what's called green stuff. Uh, which is a uh, needed type and you're it's a two-part epoxy and you're going to take a little bit of that and you're going to take the yellow and the blue and you, you rub them together and then you're going to go ahead and you're going to put it in those in those gaps to seal it off and then you're going to take the exacto knife and a couple other tools uh, to basically rub that down to it so it blends in with the miniature and after you prime it which we'll get to next because priming your miniatures is also super important <clears throat> um, uh, when you prime it, then you won't even know that that, that mold that mold or that gapping never existed, and then you're ready to go and you're ready to paint. So, like I said, uh, priming your miniatures is important. It's a uh, There are many videos that show people how to do prime. Um, and today I used Corax White and Gray, wow, whoa, Gray Sear. These are both by Citadel. There's also black primers, and there are multiple colors of primers based on the kind of model or miniature you plan on painting. And I wanted to show you the differences in that. Um, with the Song of Ice and Fire game, the miniatures come in the core box, which is the one I showed earlier, right here, uh, Stark versus Lannister. Now, this box 
All the miniatures are pre-built. They're ready to go right out of the box. And you don't even have to paint them, which is great about that game is because the, the Lannisters all come in red uh, plastic and the Starks all come in a like a greenish gray uh, plastic. So you can immediately play them and you know which armies are which and there's no issue. But because we do want to paint the miniatures and we're here to paint them today, uh, then you prime them. And I used the gray sear primer on the mountain, which is the miniature I'll be painting today, right? I'm going to actually push this down just a little bit. So we're going to use, so I used gray sear on the mountain and I just, I used Corax white on uh, the Stark miniature there. And you can see, look how big he is. Oh, it's so good. And then this is just a normal person and he's super tiny too. Ah, oh, the mountain is the best. Anyways, <laughs> and I also wanted to show off, you know, again, the quality of miniatures that you can get. So here is a Stark on a, on a, on a horse, on a cavalry. It's so good. There's, um, and the miniatures are beautiful. And that's why I chose to, to use these today uh, for painting. I'm going to uh, make some adjust, uh, camera adjustments here in a minute once I actually get in it and start showing some techniques. So the mountain is what we're going to paint. And I might even put some paint on the Stark warrior as well, just because um, there are going to be opportunities where the mountain is going to need to dry. Uh, it's Thor. Yeah, he's, he's yeah, Thor uh, in... Uh, Half half tour uh, in Iceland. That dude is ginormous, and what's funny is his brothers are even bigger than him as far as height. It's crazy. Um, but I also uh, earlier we talked about um, Whiz Kids miniatures, so I, I pulled one of these out. This is again the Griffin, and the great thing about these for beginner painters is that you don't even need to prime these because they're already pre-primed and ready to go right out of the package. So you just rip it open, go to painting. Super fun. Um, and they're they're super inexpensive. These are, and if you like Dungeons and Dragons, these are great. <clears throat> the final thing I wanted to talk about are, are two other uh, pieces of equipment that are really important. Um, is your palette, uh, what you're going to put your paints on. I sometimes will use just a piece of cardboard, like an old comic book backboard, or a plastic round palette, right? But there are wet palettes, right? So this is. A wet palette by Army Painter, and what's nice about it is it, it can hold like some of your brushes. They could already be like snapped in here and good to go, right? So everything's taken care of. Super good stuff. But what it has in it is it has this little sponge, right? And then you take one of the sheets here, and it's, it's just like a little piece of wax paper. And you're going to take a little bit of your water and you're just pour it into the sponge. And you just kind of, with your finger, with your finger, you're going to take that water, you're going to try to spread it out over the sponge, right? You might need to put a little bit more in there, which is fine. Uh, but you're going to spread that out over the sponge. And what this is going to do is when you put your paint on a wet palette, it's not going to dry out and the paint will last longer for the model that you're painting. Um, you don't have to waste. It actually is really good for conservation of paint, right? Because the paints aren't aren't inexpensive. They're a couple dollars for, per little bottle or, or pot. Then you're going to put the wax paper piece in there, and you're just going to rub that over as well, so that the water seeps up into up into the wax paper, so that again it will maintain a level of moisture to the to the paint, so that it doesn't dry out quick. And I will be using my wet palette today um, because I don't want to waste the, the the paint on the on the mountain because it's a bigger a bigger miniature and it might take some time. Some on a normal palette, it could dry out. Uh, these are plastic miniatures. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, so these are plastic miniatures. Um, they are they they they. They do come in multiple different forms. You can get resin. Um, a lot of companies that make busts of different characters that you can paint use resin for that. Um, but most of it is a form of, of, of uh, plastic. And then finally, the last thing after the uh, palette I want to talk about is basing materials. So when you're all said and done with your miniature, and I, you know, time permitting today, we probably will not get through it because I just want to talk about basic techniques for ease of entry into the space.
Um, but once you're all said and done with your miniature, you're going to want to get some basing material so that you can put that on the base and gives it a little bit more pop, a little bit more life. So like the mountain, I'd probably put some of this brown sand on there and then a few of these like cork bits that make it look like rocks. And then I'd put some tufts so it looks like there's some greenery on its base as well. And it just takes a miniature from looking great, good to making it looking great. All right. So based on that... I'm going to make a camera adjustment so that y'all can see more of what's going to happen with the miniature. And then we're going to get the painting this and see how that all goes. So there's, there's that. Here's the miniature. I think that looks good. And I apologize. You have to look at my, my, my mid frame here, but you know, such is life. <laughs> so with the mountain, because he is fully armored up and that's what's going to make this such a, a fun paint job as well is I get to use metallic paints, which Vallejo has some great metallics, right? And we're going to just grab up um, the uh, neutral gray metallic, and we're going to look at my silver and. Yeah, silver. Okay. So when you first start painting miniatures, <laughs> uh, so pewter is old. They don't do pewter anymore. Um, and then they also start out as lead. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, there is a company called Iron Wolf or Iron, I'm sorry, Ironwood Studios that has the license for the old Ralph Partha miniatures, and they still do cast in pewter lead. Uh, but they are super far and few in between. Um, and it's not cost effective. There are lots of mold issues, you're right. So no kit bashing with Game of Thrones, right? Not, not necessarily, uh, but if you are good at using green stuff and so everything, you could do some kit bashing, I guess. Um, uh, and there are, yeah, absolutely no season eight bashing. <laughs> the good old days, lead miniatures, no... Melt and mold your own Ralph Partha paints. Yeah. I, I actually really enjoyed, um, I went to Origins last year. And while I was at Origins, uh, I went to a, an event, uh, an after hours event. And there was a, the, the owner of Ironwood Studios was there with, and the table was laden with, with all of these uh, pewter miniatures that were from the old Ralph Partha um ones and it, they just look so good all right so when we get our, when we get our miniatures some of the things that are also important is hand positioning when painting so i like to put push the heels of my hands together and bring it up so that i'm stabilized so i don't have any shaking you're going to see some shaking because of the table and everything but um i do that and then i just get in there and i start doing what's called a base coat so all the major parts of the the miniature that have um, like a lot of surface area, like these the armor bits on, on the mountain, I'm going to go through and I'm going to base it with the color uh, that I want first. And then I'm going to go through and then I'm going to do what's called um, highlighting. And then after, um, you know, some of the highlighting is done, I may go back and I'll do um, some shading and then do another round of highlighting because sometimes the shade will affect my highlights. Um, so I'm going to hit these upper parts, like his pauldrons here, and his baldric, the shoulder pads, and his helmet, which I know are going to be metallics, right? So I'm going to base those with this gray metal, right? So I'm going to go through and hit those. And that's, that's the biggest part of it is basing, uh, is because you want to get the majority of your miniature uh, coverage done quick. If you, if you are like in a speed paint competition, <laughs> which I actually love entering. Um, so you go through and you're just going to paint all those areas that are going to be metal with the, the, the metallic gray base. Right? So it's kind of like a gun metal gray. And because he has so much metallic armor on, it, this is a good basing piece. And you don't have to worry about being perfect. I think that's one of the best things. Um, so they do. They have holders. Uh, uh, Citadel makes these little handheld 
um, things. And you can also put like sticky cack on the bottom of your miniatures and put those on um, cork uh, and hold the cork if you'd like. I don't think I actually have one of the um, model uh, holders here with me right now. I do not. <clears throat> but because, um, yeah, a lot of painters, uh, if they were watching and they saw that I was holding the miniature like I am uh, in my hand like this, they'd be like, oh, my God. But that was, you know, again, this is not we're not professionals here today. We're, we're intros, right? So uh, we can do it like this. And this is actually how I prefer because uh, if I hold the handle, and there are other handles that have like this hook that comes up over so you can hold it like that and you can get in there and paint, um, which is also another nice thing. Um, but yeah, they, they exist and they're good. The, uh, the other thing is with the base coating, you don't, you don't have to be perfect. And you, if you've never painted a miniature before in your life, don't expect to be perfect because I can't think of anything anybody's ever done ever where the first time they ever tried it, they were perfect. All right. Um, so the big thing is just enjoying the process, putting the paint on the miniature it, because I'm here with you guys being able to talk with you. That's also super awesome. Right. Uh, just getting the opportunity to chat with some folks, uh, answering questions that pop up in the, in the chat. Uh, you can uh, use uh, glue uh, to a plastic bottle and use it as a handle. Absolutely. Um, you can absolutely do that. Glue the base of the base of the miniature to a bottle cap. Um, like Again, like my water bottle here, I could glue them here and I could just use this as my as my um, handle, uh, which I will not do because I still want to drink this water. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, so we get through, we base base out a lot of the metallics. Um, I'm going to also pull out a color. So this is why I actually have a few of the other miniature paints out, because uh, I want to show you how some of the other paints work. Um, because there are, like Citadel has a new paint line out called Contrast Paints. And I want to show you how that works. I'm going to do it on the, on the cloak. Uh, and you're going to be like, why didn't I start off with the Contrast Paints and just use those? And the reason is certain things I like done a certain way. And as you begin painting your miniatures, you're also going to find that there's going to be certain things that you like done a certain way, right? Which is totally okay. Um, another thing that is really fun to have if you if you can get it is um, paint, uh, paint on primer, because as you're making, doing some of these miniatures and getting them all put together, you may also want to go through and do little touch-ups with your um, with your miniature uh, in certain areas and be like, ooh, I, I'm, I'm getting paint inside the lines right here. And you can just take a little bit of the paint primer, make a correction, because uh, that's one of the biggest things about painting miniatures is it's all about making corrections, <laughs> right? So we get, it, we get our bases on around the areas where there's a lot of metallics, right? So that's right there. Again, just hitting the base coats, right, of the met metallic areas. All right. Now, the thing I want to show you next is on the uh, is is the robe here. So the colors for the Lannisters, if you want to stay to theme, are yellow. Right. So the mountain, uh, his inner shield would be a yellow uh, underneath the three lions, and his robes would be yellow. I, however, um, already have this miniature painted in the Lannister colors, so I'm going to do a, something a little different today. But because I know that what I'm about to show you is going to be more dramatic in its appearance and show you the how the actual paint works for the miniature. And we're going to use um, we're going to use some contrast paint. I'm going to use an orange. All right. So this is the Griffhound Orange Contrast by Citadel. All right, and what this does is it has two different weighted pigments, paint pigments inside it. I'm not going to use the wet palette for this part. Um, and those paint pigments is when you let me make a small adjustment here. So those paint pigments are going to settle differently. The lighter paint pigments are going to stay high on the miniature, and the heavier are going to seep into the cracks of the miniature to give it more depth 
and um, presentation. Um, uh, old Luke Skywalker asks, what if you are unhappy with the paint job you have done? How can you remove paint? Uh, there, you can take uh, different um, cleaning agents such as Simple Green. Uh, you can soak the miniature and that will help get the acrylic paint off of it. But the thing is, the great thing about miniatures and paint is if you don't like it, you can just respray it with primer and paint it again because the paints aren't so thick that you're going to lose any definition really. But if you need to actually clean your your miniature, soak them in simple green, scrub them with a very, very uh, soft bristle brush, like toothbrush, to get all the paint off, and then reprime it, and then you can paint again. All right, so I'm gonna grab a couple more brushes here, and a little bit bigger one for this next little. There we go. So I'm gonna use a monster brush for this next process. So I'm going to take the contrast, I'm going to hold it up here, um, and to show you how this looks and works. So again, you're just going to paint it on as though you're just doing a, um, a base coating over the, the, the high surface area of the cloak. But what you're going to see is, once this is all said and done with this particular type of paint, the, the contrast paints, you almost don't even have to do anything else. It's literally, it's cheating in a bottle, in a good way. I'm just gonna hit the back here and then I'm gonna turn it around and kind of show you what it looks like once you've used this paint. And it's so good. I, I'm a big fan of Vallejo. Vallejo's paints are my preferred uh, paint for miniature painting. Um, but when it comes to what, again, the toolbox, and you shouldn't just you know keep yourself to one paint, but the toolbox, this, these uh, contrast paints by Citadel are just super good. And like I said, I'm just gonna do the back of the cloak real quick, I'm almost done. And then I'm gonna show you this so you can see how this works and looks. There we go. And remember, this is one coat of contrast paints. And it already looks freaking great. <laughs> Look at that. You, because like I said, the heavier, the heavier dense pigments stay in the cracks to give it that depth. And once this dries, <clears throat> it's gonna have that immediate and automatic shading and highlighted effect on, on the miniature. Um, so that is one of the great things about using uh, contrast paints is it, it just, they look so good right, right off the bat. And then what I would do, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a great cheat. Uh, then what I would do is if I wanted to highlight, like obviously his belt right there isn't gonna be the same color as his cloak. So I just go back with Vallejo paints and I would paint that that belt um, the separate the other color that uh, would be required for this miniature uh, to look, you know, so it doesn't look like, you know, it's all monochromatic in certain areas. Um, but yeah, and I'm just gonna add some more of this on here. It's such a good, like I said, it's such a good uh, tool to have in your toolbox for painting is the Citadel um, contrast paints, and then. Um, the next thing I'm going to show you all after I get, again, I'm because this is just a basic entry to painting um, course, I guess we could say. Uh, I'm going to show you a couple other really fun techniques. Uh, the next one will be dry brushing. Um, and we're going to use dry brush silver to highlight the shield. So you can see how that would take from this gunmetal gray, a very dull color, and when you dry brush the silver on it, it's going to make it highlighted and pop because of the different, you know, the texture tones are going to just pop off that miniature. I'll probably throw some dry brush uh, sp uh, spots on like his arm and his uh, helmet as well. Again, just to show you how all that is, will look and give the miniature a little bit more um, definition and uh, character. And for those of you that are watching, there are multiple levels of painting as far as like 
what people do in the hobby. You have me. I consider myself a, a hobbyist slash table ready painter. So when my miniatures are done and I can put them on a table and I can see them from three feet away, they look pretty good and they're, they're, they're easily playable. Right. Um, then there are commission painters who basically make a living from painting miniatures and their quality of miniature painting is usually really, really good. Um, and then after that is your, pro, is your absolute pro painters. Um, and then, so pro painters are like just ridiculously good. Uh, they compete in big competitions all over the world. Uh, GW has some, uh, CMON has some, uh, and there's a big one in Italy. Uh, I can't remember right off the top of my head what it is. I am not that level. Uh, but, and those guys are just, and gals, uh, are just ridiculously good at the, at the hobby that they've mastered. Um, so I like being a hobbyist table ready painter. Um, I don't think I could ever do commission work, uh, because I, if I would, if I did, I'd get lost in it and I would, you, nobody would see any weird content. So <laughs> I prefer just to paint my miniatures for tabletop play. Um, and I think that's what most people find themselves in is once they get into the hobby. Uh, but when you find yourself in those other levels of painting, uh, the community is super weird and awesome. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. All right. So I'm going to really quick throw some more uh, of this gray on the other metallic areas, like his sword here is supposed to be uh, a gray as well. So, um, or metallic. So I'm going to just really quick, just throw some paint on this sword. Uh, and when I do the dry brushing technique here, that might actually uh, be another uh, area that can pop as well. I see you guys talking in the chat about getting uh, your hands on some Citadel. <laughs> uh, I saw some uh, YouTube videos using uh, daily roundy acrylic inks and uh, Liquitex acrylics. Yeah, li so Liquitex is another great company. I don't have any. I've painted with them at a show before. Uh, they're good. They're really good. Um, tur tur uh, there's another one called Turbo Dork uh, paints, which has some really cool like um, shifter paints so that when you look at them one way and then shift them a little bit, the, light, the way the light strikes them, they change a different hue. Uh, those are really good for like cars or vehicles. Um, that you might paint if you get into like some of the bigger like warhammer has vehicles that would um, look really good with some shifters on it i think and uh, vallejo also makes some shifter paints now as well so there's a lot of like i said a lot of tools that you can throw in your toolbox with all the different companies that make paint all right so again i'm using the vallejo paint right now with this gray on the miniature there we go and that looks good. I'm just going to try to get a little bit more. There's another spot where I need to put a little bit more orange in there. I'm going to hit that up. Um, uh, send me a message. It says, but for Citadel and Vallejo, we're trying to get in touch with them. Um, yeah, Vallejo, if you if you need a contact at Vallejo, I can uh, just message me. I can get you Michelle. She's the marketing and sales manager for Vallejo um, and see what they can do with y'all. Uh, as far as Citadel, um, I only, I have some contacts there, but I don't know as far as like distribution to your guys' region. Um, uh, Miniac, Goobertown, Midwinter Minis, Squidmar Miniatures. I, yeah, I just got the Squidmar brushes. I got off uh, Kickstarter. They're great. Uh, Gamza for Terrain, Black Magic Crafts, also have Black Magic Crafts. Any starter kits available in Geeky Games? Vallejo Shifters are awesome. Yes. I'm not sure about Geeky. Uh, I don't think they have them. Uh, so, like these starter boxes um, that I have with the Vallejo stuff uh, are really nice, but there are some even more basic starter boxes that uh, Reaper makes. They're small little kits, has a miniature, has the paints and a and a um, 
again, paint by numbers guide as to where each paint goes on the miniature uh, so that you can follow along and do that. And they make videos based on each kit. WizKids uh, has got kits coming out as well. Uh, paint, paint and tape WizKids boxes. And Army Painter with Gale Force 9 makes uh, starter boxes as well. They have from your uh, basic starter to the monster starter to the mega paint, you know, paint kit. So there's a lot of options out there for getting into the hobby uh, in that beginner sense as well. All right. So we did, we've done that. We're going to let it dry just for a second. Um, if you have any questions about miniature painting, uh, please ask. Uh, I'm all about answering them as best as I can. Uh, I, I want to, as you all heard in the previous uh, bit, I do like talking about miniatures and gaming. So um, I can get caught up pretty quick in that. So, um, Also, uh, yeah, I mean, you could obviously, if you want to watch some of my content, I do some painting videos. Uh, um, I do a lot of stuff on TikTok right now. I kind of fell down that hole. Uh, I'll be making more content for YouTube. And then I on the on the Rick Rolls America Facebook page, um, I also do a, uh, a bunch of live streaming there as well. Uh, but I will say this. I do have something coming up called Geek House Live. So stay tuned. Uh, that's going to be a, I'm actually putting together an entire house that's going to have live streaming going on all the time <laughs> for a lot of different stuff. Um, is there a collectible market for old miniatures? There are actually. Uh, and the biggest one that has the biggest uh, collectible market for, for miniatures is Citadel or uh, Games Workshop. A lot of people like the older models. Uh, to paint up and, and have on display. Some of them have some really nice price points. Um, as far as like the old Reaper stuff, uh, or not Reaper, but um, Ral Partha, uh, I'm not sure if there's um, truly a market. Where you find a, collect a collectible market in miniatures is I have a miniature painted by Rick from Rick Rolls America. Signed by him on the bottom. That's or Dave Taylor from Dave Taylor Miniatures, or um, a miniature from the Rogue Shader. Um, so ha having a miniature painted by a professional or by a by a um, an influencer, I guess you could say, uh, can add to its collectability. Because the great thing again about miniatures being painted by uh, true artists of the uh, not me, <laughs> but true artists of the of the hobby. Uh, means that those in, um, that's a one of a kind job, right? The, the way that they painted this miniature for you will not be the same way and come up the exact same way as a miniature they may pay for someone else. So when you get a miniature by a, a pro painter or an influencer, that's a one of a kind paint job on a miniature, right? So that's that's a good way to consider it being collectible. But also they have limited edition models like uh, uh, Gale Force Nine has uh, miniatures that are limited to like only 2,500 of this model will ever be made or 1,500 or 1,000 or 750. So there's another thing. Or if you get like con exclusive miniatures like uh, Games and Gears has made uh, Gen Con miniatures every year that you can only get at Gen Con. Uh, and other companies do that as well. So uh, limited edition miniatures are add to the collectability. Um, Old Citadel or old Games Workshop miniatures are collectible, and then individually one of a kind painted miniatures by influencers and pros uh, make it collectible. Uh, so it will be like a TikTok house, but who's to say there won't be an annoying dance? Who doesn't want to watch this guy dance to the savage? <laughs> No, it, so every room at, at Geek House Live will be set up for studio production, uh, except for the bedrooms and the bathrooms. So all the common rooms, the living room, the dining room, the family room, the basement, uh, the kitchen uh, will all be set up so that I'll be doing geek themed cooking shows. I'll be doing live stream gaming, unboxings, toys, comics, everything. It's going to be wild. It's going to be, and it's going to also be a, where people who are content creators that are on, that are traveling, uh, if they want to stop in, I have two spare bedrooms. They can stop in and stay a few days, make content, have fun, have access to all the weird stuff I've got as far as tabletop stuff uh, so that they can be like, okay, I want to run a game featuring this big 
the the ship from Wiz Kids, this Fallen Star. So it's it's gonna be like that. It's gonna be it's gonna be blessed. Yep, tabletop sessions. I'll be doing uh, live stream tabletop gaming and live stream uh, role playing games where people can come into a Zoom call and play with me, uh, and we'll live stream it. So I, anybody in the world, well, it's like, hey, I want to play in a one shot D and D with you. Done. Let's make it happen. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Sweet. All right, so the miniature is relatively dry in the spaces. I want to now do some uh, highlighting, some dry brushing. And because I'm going to dry brush, I'm not going to put this the silver on the wet palette. I'm just going to put a little bit on my on my um, paper towel. All right. Uh, let me shake this up because I don't want it to be like just liquid. You know, the, the, there's a liquid in there that can be a little bit... Um, like not enough pigment, it's just the worst. All right, and then I'm gonna grab a dry brush. I know I have a bazillion of them. There we go. <clears throat> so a dry brush a lot of times has a sharp angle at the tip and it's a little bit shorter bristles and sometimes they're even shorter than this. And, um, but that's, uh, and the reason why is because you want a little bit of a shorter tougher bristle and <clears throat> let me make a small camera adjustment again so on the um paper towel, i'm going to just take a little bit off there i'm going to take it over to this part i'm just going to wipe it away wipe it away on the paper towel until it almost doesn't come off anymore uh so that's like totally off the brush and you barely see any on there and then you're going to take your brush and going against the grain against the grain of the miniature you're going to just lightly brush that silver across those areas, um, right? So I'm not going to paint along the same line. I'm going to go against the line, and that's going to cause it to just hit those highlighted spaces across the miniature's um, uh, grooves and stuff. So it pops off, and I'm going to do it again over these lions, so that there's a little silver on the edges of the lines and it's going to pop off the miniature. So it gives it depth and character and it just looks amazing. So when I show you in the close up, something as simple as dry brushing makes it look so much better, right? It's an amazing technique that uh, doesn't require a high skill level. And there are actually painters that say, I don't dry brush at all. I'm all about painting up the layers to get to that same kind of effect. I, again, am not a pro painter. I only want to get my miniatures ready for the tabletop. And that's a great way to get them to have some character, some depth, and still look really good. And I'm going to do it again to the pauldrons and to his arms and to his helmets. Uh, so I'll give you another quick shot of what it looks like before dry brush what it looks like after, right, on the shield. So well, let's do those pauldrons, arms, across those high, the high points of the miniature to give it just that nice depth change and make the miniature pop out and give it, gives it a lot more character than a base uh, color and I'm just taking I'm just br dry brushing off uh, like I said before off the edge and then on the sword what I'm gonna do is I can do the same thing just hit the edge opposite of the of the blade um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm instead of like rubbing it this way I'm actually gonna run the edge like that on each side so it's gonna give that look of a sharpened blade okay give it on the other side there and then we're going to go ahead and do some dry brushing across the the face of the mat of the helmet and the it's got like a chain coif underneath and we'll hit across that one more time here And yeah, so again, you can see the difference 
in what it looked like previously to now when it has the highlights. It's kind of interesting. Uh, my landlord just asked me, where did I learn my painting techniques from? That's a great question, actually. And I'm surprised nobody answered in there. It makes me heart sad. No, I'm just kidding. Um, like much, uh, it's like watching a, a Miger Bob Ross with less hair. Yeah, I'm a bigger Bob Ross with less hair. I actually used to have a show called Painting Happy Little Minis where I would wear a Bob Ross wig and paint miniatures live <laughs> twice a week. Anyways, <clears throat> where did I learn my techniques? <clears throat> first, um, I, I first learned how to paint from my grandmother when I was very little. Um, she owned a ceramic shop. And, you know, so I learned how to like pour ceramics and all that when I was, I want to say like when I was eight or nine years old, I was helping her pour the slip into the molds. And then she started teaching me how to do some painting uh, when I was really young. Um, then I watched other painters at, when I go to different hobby stores when I was older, like when I was in the military, every time you go to a new store, there's always like a really good house painter. And I'd always ask questions and sit down with them and paint some miniatures and get some good uh, tips there. But to, to tell you the truth, where I've learned the most about miniature painting was I had the opportunity on Painting Happy Little Minis, my co-host was Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor is possibly one of the best pro painters in the world. He is amazing. Uh, he's a great educator. And I got to sit next to him for three years and watch him do his art. And uh, that as a benefit to my abilities uh, is un unimaginable. The, the, um, the value add that, that gave my skill set. I was already okay then. And I'm still, in my opinion, just okay in comparison. But his his tutelage, his guidance, everything, his demeanor, his patience <laughs> uh, really helped uh, build my skill sets up. And um, if Dave is watching or should ever see this, thank you, Dave. You were amazing. He's actually one of my one of my best friends. Um, and, you know, anyways, uh, no more waxing poetic on this. <laughs> um but yeah, so Dave Taylor is absolutely uh, the reason I have the skill sets I have today. Um, so, okay, so we've gone through, we even did the legs there, put some silver around the legs, right? And uh, now the, all, all the metal, metallic areas are dry brushed and uh, a little bit highlighted as well. Um, I had a little bit too much on the bottom there, so that's an easy fix. I'll just take a little bit of that base gray and I'll just paint over it, fixed, all right? So that's that's dry brushing with a little bit of highlighting. Um, now, after you're all done with your miniature in regards to the dry brushing and the highlighting and the base coating, then you're gonna go and you're gonna start doing your fine detail painting. Your fine detail painting is gonna be the most, I, I, you consider it tedious part of the paint because you're gonna be using brushes that have tips like that. I don't even know if you can see the, the tiny little brush bristles are, there's very few. So these are, and this right here is called the insane detail brush. So you're gonna be taking a brush like this. And the reason I like this particular one uh, is because it is triangulated instead of a round handle. And when it's triangulated, when you hold it in your hand, it's not gonna potentially roll in your fingers because you don't wanna mess up because this is gonna be the brush where, here, I'm gonna move the camera again, I apologize down a little bit. So this is the brush that you're going to use when you're going to get in to these very small detailed areas. Like there's a back band here that goes across his back and, it, uh, you know, paint some leather and then paint the dots. There's some riveted dots across his back. Uh, again, back to the, to the belt. You're going to want to use that to get that belt. So he, it, the paint stays in that small area. Um, there's even some other spots like on his legs, uh, uh, even his helmet for possible little highlights. And um, yeah, so there's just small areas where this brush is gonna help get some details. So like even on like his legs here and um, here in his like his uh, van brace and his rear brace on his arm, 
uh, hitting these small little like rivets, uh, and they're with like uh, another metallic, like a tinny tin or a um, a brass or a bronze to give it a uh, a different color and also give it again more character, more depth, more pop. Uh, so that's what uh, the fine detail brushes are going to help you with. Um, I'm actually going to take this dab here and I'm going to get up under his arm and this a little bit under there. So I just want to hit that up. There we go. So yeah, and then on the front, he's got the belt buckle. And again, you're not going to use a big bristle brush on a belt buckle. So you're going to use those fine detail brushes to hit those small areas. Um, so that again, it'll give your character and your miniature more depth, more, uh, more separation of space, which is really good. I apologize. I'm just seeing little imperfections and it's making me like, I should probably go in and touch that area up a little bit. It's, but what's good about it, it's in spots like up in the, up in the arm crotch that you can't really see anyway. So I've got a little paint on me, the hazards of painting. Um, so there, uh, yeah. So that's basically how that would all work. Um, is, uh, the detail brush is going to make those things happen there. And I'm going to go ahead and, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, grab a color. I'm going to grab a brown and I'm going to make a few little detailed spots happen here. Uh, not that color. I don't like it. Not for this project. Um, yeah, I'm going to grab another paint color here. Uh, yeah, here for, I got mahogany brown. I think mahogany brown is going to work just fine. <laughs> Watered down glue for base them, add your dirt and stuff last. Uh, so you can. I know. I know. Um, so you're going to use like the Elmer's glue uh, type of glue, and you're going to just take. Um, I use like a brush like this or one that's a little bit smaller than this uh, that has the same kind of rough bristles, and I'll put the glue on, and I'll just kind of push it push it along the base until the entire base is covered. And then I take the miniature and I dip it into the, the little cup, right? And I shimmy it around and then I pull it out and that'll give me that, those bases uh, effect, the, the, the start of the base effect. And then I take a little bit of that Elmer's glue and I'll put it on a paper plate or on a, a hard palette, not a wet palette. And then I will take the tufts of green or the smaller um, bits that look like stone, but it's actually just cork. I'll use, a, I'll use a, uh, a pair of tweezers. I'll grab it. I'll dip it in the glue, and then I'll place it along the base uh, to add that extra texture and extra effect. And I do it. I personally do that last. I do know that there are some painters after they prime their miniature and uh, did their and do their base coating that they will do their base, then they'll do their highlights. Because sometimes after you've put your base on, after you've done your, so you, you put your base paints on your miniature, then you do the basing effect on the miniature, and the color scheme of the basing effect can sometimes influence and actually augment the colors you may use in your highlights and more defined um aspects of your miniature paint afterwards. So I personally don't do that, but I've seen the individuals that do, and I think those individuals tend to lean into the pro space. <clears throat> Old Luke Skywalker's question. That is a great question. And I, um, if you are colorblind or color deficient, I would say, first, I'd, I would apologize to the for, for the industry not being able to provide a better source for you or individuals that have that uh, particular um, uh, issue in their life. Uh, yeah, it's a tough one. Um, Cause you know, being colorblind, you, you, you can miss a whole range of spectrum of colors that uh, would, would have been the, the correct choice. And if you are colorblind or color deficient, you don't even know what that color as far as using color theory uh, might look or how that effect will be on the miniature um, based on guessing outside of like, you can read it obviously and say, this is supposed to be mahogany brown belts should be brown. I'm going to use this, 
not knowing if it's the right brown you want or not. I think it is a lot of let's just go for it, but because they are labeled to give you an idea of what the color should be and what we as, you know, what we put a normative on different things as far as um, what certain colors should be on certain clothing type pieces that might help make it so that it's easier for them to paint. But it's a good question. And uh, I apologize if I did not give you the best answer. Colorblind friendly palette, blue, red or blue, brown would also work for the most common conditions of CBD. All of these work well since blue would generally look blue to someone with CBD. Yeah, or you could just end up with the pink Spider-Man like Jason mentioned earlier, which probably looked pretty cool. And I would be upset if I saw that. Um, so uh, so as a final, because we're getting right, we've only got like two more minutes left. Uh, let me just, again, adjust. Um, so yeah, so that's, and I hope that was a lot of good information that you guys uh, and gals and everybody in the chat um, were able to uh, at least get a good base of uh, appreciation and understanding of how miniature painting is achieved. The fact that you do not need to be the best the first time out. You don't need to be the best the 50th time out. You just need to have fun, uh, enjoy the hobby, and put at least three different colors on your miniature if you're gonna put it on a table. <laughs> That's like a Games Workshop rule for tournament play of uh, Warhammer. All right, Geeky or Ricky. What's up, brother? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just sitting here watching, man. Did, it, did you learn anything? Did it help? Yeah, yeah, I definitely did. Between you and that other one I watched the other day, I, I learned a lot. It's really made me want to do it. I mean, I want to play the game. Like, I want to do, like, Kill Team and stuff. I want yeah. to get both. I want to get 40K and I want to get the other one because you can do so much, especially if you start, like, kit bashing and everything. I'm not, like, this crazy good artist, but I have painted before and that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, watching you and watching this guy, Marcus, I'm like, I think I could do that, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> and you, the thing is, you make it pretty simple to understand and stuff, you know, because mm -hmm. I think it could be pretty daunting and intimidating to people. But, you know, having watched you sit there and get all of that done in such a short amount of time, for me, it doesn't seem daunting. It seems like this is my time to sit down and just put on some nice soft music and do my mm -hmm. thing and forget about everything else and everybody else and i'm not running around in a game shooting people in the face it's just this nice relaxing thing as much as you want to put into it is how much you get out of it to me like the more detail you put into it and stuff the more it matters to you so when you go to somebody's house or whatever depending on what's going on with corona and you put that on the table and they're like oh man let me check that out you know what i mean like it's something you'll be proud of Absolutely. Uh, we got a good question here. Says, does Rick have a painting soundtrack? Uh, I do. I listen to either Dungeon Master Radio on Pandora, a wide mix of different types of music, or I listen to the Lord of the Rings or Skyrim soundtracks. <laughs> yeah, those are good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for everybody who watched, I hope this, again, was super educational for you. I hope that you guys and gals got um, some good information that you can take to your table and, and enjoy the painting and uh, just again, join our hobby and have fun, and it's such a it, it's such a welcoming space, and I want to see more people at our table. I actually want to I want to play some games with you, Enrique. Whatever we can get together, man. Yeah, cool. <laughs> play, play something, right? Yeah. Man. And I think too the difference between like because a lot of people, and this is a question that I would ask, is if I'm a hardcore gamer, which obviously I am, why would mm -hmm. I want to go over to this? And what's the difference in the communities of say like a game like Overwatch and mm -hmm. people who do tabletop? Okay, so uh, I think a, a reason someone might want to like take a take a break from playing Overwatch or um, Fortnite or any of those other uh, video games, um, Apex Legends, you know, all those fun things, uh, is because the benefit of sitting down and playing a, a miniature skirmish game like Warhammer or Kill Team or Gravespire or, or Ice and Fire that I just painted is this: the human interaction of the of your opponent across from you. Being able to see their body language and their excitement in the play, and just a, having a true human interaction uh, that yeah. you can see and, and, and sometimes smell. <laughs> 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 but it, I think just the, the more human interaction is why coming to the table is a good break from video game and uh, digital formats. And plus, it's better for your eyes. <laughs> 
What's so, the worst tabletop etiquette? The biggest one is being a sore loser and being a bad winner. You can be you can be both. The reason we play games is to have fun, and if we can be if we, if they can keep it that way, let's keep it that way. But don't be a bad loser and don't be a bad winner. Be good. <laughs> Let your win do the talking for you. Yeah, and and be humble. Uh, being humble at the table is also nice. I mean, sure, you can be like, oh, I got you this time, or like, it seems weird that I have 10 wins and you have four. That's, that's weird to me. Uh, yeah. But but if you're playing for money and uh, or, or whatever at, like, big tournaments, for like for Magic the Gathering, there are still money tournaments, like $1,000 Grand oh, Prix. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, stuff like that. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some of the competitive tabletop games fall into some eSport like events in the near future like I could see kill team being a eSport thing it, especially if you have good per- people have good on-camera personalities that can keep uh, viewers engaged and of, of course if you have great announcers so guys with good beards <laughs> yeah yeah they got to have epic beards on the male side and then the women's side they just got to be aggressive and killers it, yeah there's a lot of potential I think for that crossover even on in the eSports space. But yeah, I'm definitely interested in, in learning more and doing more. I mean, I was already, but now I really am. So awesome. I think afterwards, I'll probably like reach out to you and talk Please. a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody wants to, to watch you, talk to you, that kind of thing, where mm-hmm. should they go? So the best place to go is on Facebook or Twitter. You can look up Rick Rolls America. Rick Rolls with a Z, America. You can find me on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. But if you if you have to be on TikTok, I do make a lot of TikTok videos and content. And I am known as Tabletop Santa uh, on there. And I view social media as anything. If you like what I do, and uh, let's say TikTok goes away or any of them go away, there will be another social media platform. And I'll be either Rick Rolls America or Tabletop Santa on either one of them. And then if you guys want to check out Jason, it's Geeks and Games uh, Guitar. So, you know, and again, he, you know, if you're looking to try any of the stuff that we talk about, a lot of the board games and stuff Jason has, uh, or he could probably get for you. So, and speaking of girl gaming, uh, next week, you guys make sure you sign up for the, for the next workshop because we're going to have world famous gamer and cosplayer Elodia, which would be really cool. And then we're going to have local, uh, female gamer and singer, uh, Sachi Gomez, which will be really cool. So it's basically going to be girls' night out. Me and the girls just talking about games. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. So we have awesome. somebody pretty with us this week, and then we'll have somebody pretty with us next week. <laughs> and you, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks as always to Carter Games Expo for giving us something interesting to do and see during this time of social distancing and introducing us to all these amazing people. You included, obviously. (laughs) Nice.